when we sing that, we're not just singing the words of a song. Lord, we're declaring to you that there's nobody in our life that's anything like you. God, you stand unmatched. You stand uncontested. And Father, oftentimes in our life, you don't get you don't get the control. You don't get the say that we know that we should give you. Today, God, as we declare there's nobody like you, as we declare that you're the greatest part of who we are, Lord, we want to let you know today that we surrender to you. Lord, we're here to give you our all, not just in worship. We're here to give you all in our effort. We're here to give you all in our attention. And Lord, this morning, we're not just here to hear the word. We're here to to be molded and shaped into your image. You didn't call us to be listeners. You called us to be disciples. God, you didn't call us to just hear the word. You called us to do the word. You called us to be the hands and feet in, uh, of Christ. You called us to be the body. And so today, God, I pray that you would mobilize Fusion Madison. And I don't want to just pray for this church, for every church in this county, that we would be mobilized for the kingdom. Lord, we would get off of our spiritual rear ends and start moving for the kingdom of God. We are here for a time such as this. Lord, the church can whine and complain about the condition of the world, or it can realize it's always been the medicine. It's always been the medicine. And this morning, Lord, we want to be the salve. We want to be that good medicine that's in our community that lets people know there is hope, that lets people know there is healing, that lets people know for every brokenness, for every sin, for every failure, for everything we've ever done wrong, every drop of blood was, was spilled by Christ on that cross at Calvary so that we wouldn't walk around condemned. We wouldn't walk around feeling the weight and the guilt of our sin, but we would walk around as new creations in Christ, not believing the lies of the enemy, but brand new. Lord God, you do not refurbish us. We're not some dressed up old version of ourselves. We are brand new. We're brand new creatures in Christ. And today, Lord, we give you our heart. We give you our time. We give you our attention. Have your way in this place, in this place, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, lift up a hand clap of praise and a shout this morning. Come on, we can do better than that, Fusion. Let's go. All right, all right. You can go ahead and be seated. It is so good to be with you this morning, and uh, as Whitney said, there's obvious vacancies in our uh, in our church this morning. I'll give you three guesses on who it was, and uh, the first two don't count. But uh, I am so grateful for Christian. Give it up for Christian. Christian leads. He leads. He, he loves that. He loves that actually. Um, Christian and Destiny lead our youth. He also just, he's been on our worship team, but he pinch hit for me and, and got in there and, and helped us out. Pastor Kate, thank you so much. And uh, I, I, McKenna, thank you, baby, for stepping up and being bold. 16 years old, man. It's hard for her to get up here and sing out, but dad just pushed her in the back and hit her in the diaphragm and out it came. It was like, but uh, no, we're so grateful that we're able to have uh, people step up and and uh, we just we just a, a lot of good things, man. The Lord is good. Amen. 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 Hey, if you have your Bible, we're going to be over in the book of Nehemiah again this morning and uh, we're going to be going on in our building together series. Look at your neighbor say building together. I, I feel like you got a little bit of energy yet to burn. So look at your neighbor and say building together. All right. All right. We're building together. And uh, man, I. I said this in the first couple of weeks, and I was remiss to say it last week, but I want to I just say this because this, is, this needs to be our understanding as we are a growing church, as we are, are moving out into what God has us to do in this area and in this region. I want us to fully understand this because sometimes I lose sight of this myself. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. And that really is the truth. Unless the Lord is in it, unless the Lord is doing it, unless the Lord is opening doors, we can try and try and try on our own human efforts and run up against pure vanity, man. We can, we can try and just get fatigued and get tired. And, uh, and so I don't want to do that. I don't ever want to be guilty of that. Sometimes I, as a pastor, let you down. And sometimes I get out in the flesh and I have to reel myself back in. And sometimes I even have to apologize. Ask my elders if I have to apologize once in a while. But sometimes I have to apologize. And uh, I want to, as we're as we're moving forward and we're building together, man. I want to remember that uh, I want to remember what we're working on is 
is just a box. It's just bricks, sticks, and mortar over on in that other location. This is just a box. This is just bricks, sticks, and mortar. In fact, this was a this was a former Grange Hall. This was turned into a church. It didn't start its life off as a church. And I hope long after we're gone, it's still a church. But ultimately, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are where the Spirit of God resides. You are the place. When we shut the lights off here, God doesn't live here. This is not where he just hangs out all the time. He goes with you wherever you go. And so we need to remember that. We need to remember what we're doing because ultimately the reason that we are in Madison is not because of buildings and land and acreage and all those things. We're here for you. That's why we're here. And ultimately, we're here for everybody that doesn't know we're here for them yet. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. We, we are here to see the captive set free. We're here to see the name of Jesus proclaimed all over this region, all over this area. And we are here to let God do what God wants to do. Amen? Amen. Come on. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are doing what you want to do. We want you to have your way in this place. Lord, we can plan and we can postulate and we can, we can try to have everything in order. We can try to even order our life. You, you, you even tell us that, that we will plan our way, but the Lord will plot our steps. Lord, we, we have a way of, of, of at times just being so plan oriented that we forget to be prayer oriented, that our, pro, our plans shouldn't become our prayer, but our prayer should become our plans. Lord, that's good. You just gave me that. Our plan should never be our prayer. Our prayer should become our plans. And I pray today, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us. I pray, Lord, as we talk corporately for what you're doing, not only at Fusion, I pray that we would see our individual lives in this. Each one of us has an assignment from God on this earth. We are all called men and women of God who have a purpose in this world. And I pray today that you would stir that up inside of each one of us. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I told you in, in, uh, in, the, in, in the first couple of weeks of this, and this is really the truth. I have no desire as a pastor to have an Old Testament view of vision. And pastors talk a lot about vision and a lot about destiny and a lot about purpose. And if you read the Old Testament... Uh, if you read the Old Testament, vision and, and, and purpose and plans were often delivered to the man of God or the prophet of God. The man of God or the prophet of God would speak to the people of God. The people of God would respect that that voice and they would follow that man of God into what it was that, that God had called them into. And then something refreshing happens in the New Testament. Something different, something that's never happened before happens in Acts chapter 2. God allows his Holy Spirit to not just fall on the man of God or the prophet, but everybody who is praying and seeking together, the Holy Spirit falls on all of them. And at one time, the entire church catches the vision. And that's what I want to be. I want to be a church where the entire church catches the vision at the same time and, and and not just the vision for fusion madison but the vision that god has for your life i don't know about you but i believe that god has a purpose for every single one of us and and oftentimes that purpose revolves around our family or that purpose seems to revolve around our work life and we'll allow it to become that we'll allow our purpose to be our 40 hour work week in life and and i don't know what your job is or what you do for a living but i know for me there's times where i've gone through and i just i i'll get so engaged in what i'm doing that i that i have to step back and go lord i know there's more than this i know you have me here for more than this e even when i started off in ministry and we planted what was then pavilion community church i started off spreading fertilizer so that I could so that I could plant a church. Yeah, I spread fertilizer for Tuttle's landscaping. And I knew while I was spreading that fertilizer around that the Lord had more for me than just making grass green, okay? And and, and so and so I I, I went to I, I went and I was a teller at a bank. I was the worst teller ever. I, I mean I didn't steal nothing but somehow every every day my drawer was like ten cents short and I just panicked, you know, because they tell you like if you're fifty dollars short, you could potentially be prosecuted. I'm like, I'm making eight bucks an hour. I quit, okay? And so, so, so I left, I left the banking industry and then, and then I did, a, and then I did a short stint in life insurance for a couple of years. I was selling life insurance and I was selling eternal life insurance all at the same time. And, and I still knew, I still knew it was a, it was a good job. I was, I was able to hand checks across the table to widows and stand in the gap for their husbands for, for just a little bit, a $250,000 check. I was able to step up when everybody else was stepping out. But still, still, I knew that God had more for me than that, than just working and just earning and just cruising to, to, to can, I, can I just say something to a group of people who may think they're, they're nearing the end of, of what God has for them? God has more for you than just collecting Social Security and golfing. 
God has more for you than just going to work and getting a paycheck and working 40 hours. God has more for you even than just raising for your, your, your family. Those are all good things. And, and God can work and, and move in and through those things. But I want to tell you this morning, God has a plan for your life. He has a vision for your life. And we'll quote it to our kids and we'll hang it over their crib, won't we? Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. We love that scripture. You, you can buy that on plaques at Hobby Lobby all over the place for like forty-seven eighty-eight. If you wait one week, it'll be 50% off. It'll be $23 next week, okay? That's not half the math, but I went to Madison. Settle down, all right? So, so... So here's the deal. Here's the deal. We love to quote. We love to quote scripture about plan and purpose, and we love to believe that God has a destiny for us. But I believe that some of us get so caught up in the trappings of this life and so caught up in the work of this life that we begin li living in the land of lost dreams. We lay our dreams down. We lay our destiny down. We lay our destiny down for a 40-hour work week. We lay our plan down for the safety and the security of a job. We'll lay our plans and our destiny down for, for that 401k or that pension. But I want to tell you this, man. God told us to not store up our treasures on earth, but to store them up in heaven. And he said the treasures we lay up on this earth, thieves will break it and steal, and moth and rust will come and destroy those treasures. But he said, if you lay up your treasures in heaven, thieves can't break Break in and steal there. And moth and rust can't destroy there. What you lay up there, it'll be waiting for you. Unlike Social Security here, it will be there in the next place. I promise you. I promise you. You will never regret making a deposit in eternity. You'll never regret saying yes to God. You may learn the regret of saying no to Him at some points in your life, as we all have. But you'll never regret saying yes. You'll never regret getting into that journey with the Lord. And there are times where we need to be reminded. We need to talk about vision. We need to talk about having, having that vision for our life because without a vision, the people perish. We've got to have a vision for our life. And, and so we've been working through the book of Nehemiah. And if you haven't listened to the other three sermons, there's a YouTube channel that's connected to our Facebook page. And uh, I would love for you to go out and listen to those. But we talked about three or four different building blocks so far out of the book of Nehemiah as it concerns vision. And number one, we talked about that vision begins as a Concern. Everybody say concern. Oftentimes vision begins as a concern and that concern it creates a problem in our spirit. We begin to see a problem. We begin to notice it. We begin to recognize it and we struggle with that concern. And, and God might point the same thing out to you over and over and over. And the whole time you might be stepping over the problem and then there's one day that problem grabs your foot and won't let it step over it no more. And it grips your heart. It becomes something that you can't walk past anymore. You can't walk past homelessness anymore. You can't walk past hunger anymore. Or you can't walk past disenfranchised youth anymore. You know in your spirit that something could be and should be done. And, and we'll start off oftentimes looking around like, okay, Lord, I'll come alongside of somebody. And God says, I'm going to send some people alongside of you because I'm giving the vision to you. God presents you with the problem because you're the person that he is providenced to take care of it oftentimes. Vision will begin as a concern. We know that Nehemiah heard about the condition of his homeland. He heard about the reproach of his people. And it troubled him to his core. Now, Nehemiah didn't jump into immediate action. We talked about building block number two, that vision does not always require immediate action. What Nehemiah did with that first was Nehemiah got on his face and he wept and fasted and he prayed and some of you hear about 24 you guys were all excited reverend El was over to the church You're like the church is going to be open for 24 hours they're going to pray you're like okay they're fasting and it was crickets it was crickets did you hear it it was like woohoo 24 hours prayer fasting Woo, what's that <laughs> Nehemiah got on his face because it, it bothered him to the core that his people were living beneath what God had called them to be. And sometimes that's the, isn't that the vision of the church? That we look at a neighborhood and we go, this isn't all God has for you. Or we'll drive to a town and we'll see the condition of a town and see the condition of a people. And we should know inside of our spirit, that's not all God has for you. Then it should bother us because we know inside of our spirit what God has for them and, and what God can do in and through them and how God could bring an entire community back alive. And so Nehemiah gets on his face, he weeps and he fasts and he prays. It bothers him so much that he begins giving up meals and giving up his free time. 
And sometimes that is the immediate action. We will sometimes tend to get out on our own. We'll get out ahead of our skis a little bit and we'll try to make things happen on our own. If you've never tried to make things happen on your own, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. But I've tried to kick at doors that were dead bolted and broken my leg. I mean, there's times where we will beat our head against a wall that is not meant to come down. You can't always make things happen on your own. Sometimes through that prayer and through that, that, that fasting, God is using you to, to pray and fast to open that door so that when the time is right, because vision at the wrong time, or another way of saying it, the right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing. Let me say that again because you didn't hear me. Teenagers, you need to hear it too. The right thing at the wrong time is still the wrong thing. It's got to be the right thing at the right time. I think there might have been a, a song about that. I don't know. But, 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 but nonetheless, man, vision does not always require immediate action. Building block number three. Everybody say number three. Now, some of us don't like doing this part. But Nehemiah t- took time to, to travel around the city to see where the breaches in the wall were at. The Bible says that he didn't tell anybody he was there. Nobody. He, he spoke to nobody. Not even the people that came with him did he tell them what they were going to be doing. And at nighttime, he would travel around the city and see where the breaks were at in the wall and see what condition the gates and things like that were in. And what ended up happening with Nehemiah is he saw the problem that was in front of him because he was studying before he started. And some of us, listen to me, some of us in here want the promotion without the preparation. Let me say that again because that's so good you didn't say you're not, you're not amen and as good as I'm preaching. Some of us want the promotion before the preparation. Preparation always precedes promotion. You need to know that, that there's always a season in our life where God is preparing us for what he has for us, and we cannot get ahead of that. There's times where what's done on the inside of us and what's worked on the inside of us, in order for vision to come to pass, God is doing a work on the inside of us, and we cannot get out ahead of that. Building block number four, and then I'm going to get into the new one. Building block number four was risk and sacrifice. Risk and sacrifice. We need to understand that vision always has risk and sacrifice involved. Always. Every single time, it's going to cost us something. Anytime that God calls you to something, there's going to be something else that you lay down. And we have to know that there's risk and sacrifice involved. I can tell you this, man, there's been so many times in our life, there's been so many times in our life where God has called us to things and where God has has put his hand on our life and he's asked us to do big things and he's asked us to start churches and move communities and things like that, that we've gotten, we've gotten to the place. My wife and I've gotten to the place when we actually are uneasy when we feel at rest. We've gotten to the place where comfort actually gets a little bit uncomfortable because I've learned in my life that oftentimes the voice of God and the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the voice of uh, of what he wants to do in my life it comes at the greatest risk that we take. Amen? Amen. 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 Reverend L, how did it feel when God told you that you were coming to America? Well, he had a wife, but I want to talk about building block number 5. I apologize to everybody because we had to change service times because people people aren't here, but we'll be here next week. Building block number five to vision is this. You will face criticism. Everybody say criticism. criticism. How many people love criticism? Huh? Nobody? How many people like constructive criticism? All right. See, not all criticism is bad. This coffee could be better. Not all, not all criticism is bad. But I'm gonna tell, I, I want to tell you this. You're going to face the kind of criticism that's not constructive. If you are called by God to do a big thing, to do a God-sized thing, I want to promise you something. Criticism is going to come your way. Vision is very easy to criticize. I mean super easy to criticize. Some of you have had vision for your life and you've had it snuffed out by criticism. We tell our kids that they can grow up and be anything that they want to be, right? You can do, baby, you can do anything you want to do. 
anything you want to do. And then your kid hits about 17 and you're like, all right, uh, my kid wants to be a pro athlete. He's five foot four. Hunter, huh. That was not directed at nobody, okay? I feel like... Let me just turn the... You know what I'm saying? Like, we will start getting realistic with our kids at some point in time. Like, we, 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 we'll, we'll tell them at the, a young age, you can be anything that you want to be. We'll let them wear cowboy boots and the hat. You know, we, knowing full well, there's no Wild West left. You can't go be a gunslinger, but we'll let them dress like they can go be one. Or we'll tell them, yeah, we'll let them wear astronaut boots and a, and, and a rocket, you know, hat, or, you know, and but we know full well, we know full well unless you are going to be able to be admitted into MIT and you're going to, be, well, like we literally compare our smartest people to rocket scientists and we'll tell like, yeah, you could be an astronaut if you want to be. We start getting realistic. But I will say this as well, that oftentimes, oftentimes, not only are we realistic, there are times where we will snuff out real God-given dreams in our children or people in our life will snuff out real God-given dreams in our life because vision is super easy to criticize. And we'll start asking questions about what it is that they're going to do. Well, how are you? Have you thought about this? Well, what about this? And I'm going to tell you this God given vision, a lot of God given vision has died at the hands of what about questions? What about this? What about that? Have you considered this? How are you going to finance this? Is anybody going to follow you? Is anybody going to help you? Do you have a plan? Do you have a business plan? You didn't even go to school for this. How do you know this is the right thing to do? You don't have an education for this. You're not smart enough. You're not. And what about, what about, what about, what about? And eventually the attitude of that person, unless they're a strong and resolved person, that will begin to erode at the vision that we have in our life. I've learned this when it comes to God. If the, if the vision is from God, there's no what about that's going to get rid of what's gnawing at your heart. If the dream is from God and the destiny is from God, there's no amount of what about that's going to create a problem in your circumstances. In fact, I, I want to tell you this, after 20 years of ministry, and I used to laugh at my buddy, Pastor Jim Strive, for talking about how long he'd been in ministry. I was like, he always says it, now I'm doing it all the time. But, but I, I, I've learned this after so many years and after so many churches behind us. If, there, if, if there's not some problems with what God is showing me, if it doesn't seem too big that it makes me a little bit uncomfortable, I've learned in my life that it's more of an idea than it is a vision. A vision from God should present some problems for me. A dream should present some problems. There should be some whatabouts that are big whatabouts that are like, you know what, I don't know the answer to that. Finances is always, always my favorite one. People are always like, well, how are you going to finance it? I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to finance it. Well, how are you going to get started? It'll be all good. Well, pastor, how can you have that sort of confidence? Well, he's done it one, two, three times. So based off of what he's done back there, I've started to trust him with what he's going to do over here. See, we won't let our past victories give us confidence for the future. The devil robs us of that sometimes. Some of the things that God has done behind us should give us confidence moving forward, but skepticism kind of stays in front of us. Like, oh, you know what? Oh, and, and you need to remember where he's brought you from. You need to remember the ways that he's provided for you. You need, you need to remember the doors that he's opened for you. You didn't have to open those then. And why would he start closing them now when he's brought you this far? God hasn't brought you this far to leave you. He hasn't brought you this far to give up on you. He hasn't brought you from where you were. He hasn't delivered you from the things he's delivered you from just to set a trap in front of you. That's not God. But we'll start to believe it is. You know what? I'm going to stumble and fall. I'm going to trip up. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I don't know. You know, God, I feel like God's putting a calling on my life, but I, I, I'm too old. I feel like God's putting a calling on my life, but it costs too much to go to college. God, God's putting a vision in my life, but it, 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 it. And all the time, that doubt and that fear begins to try to creep in the devil doesn't ever stop trying to talk to you but eventually you got to mature enough to say you know what i know who i am shut up Amen. three of you awesome fantastic i'm going to talk to about 90 more of you right now <laughs> you're going to face criticism when it comes to vision there's more referees than there are teammates 
There's more people blowing the whistle and trying to whistle things dead than there are people cheering you on. There's more referees than there are cheerleaders. And there's more, there's more people who want to ask you the tough questions and they're just holding you accountable. Let me ask you the tough question. Let me ask you some tough questions. How many cattle does God own? Because the Bible says he owns cattle on a thousand hill. What's one of the names of God? His name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. It's Jehovah Nisi, my banner. It's Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom. He's bigger than what he's brought me to. Let me ask you some tough questions. You might have some questions regarding the plan and the plot course of how things are going to happen in the life of somebody who's a visionary. But the biggest question that person should turn around and ask their critics it's how much do you trust God? See, sometimes the right thing to do with the criticism you face, because Jesus did it over and over and over in Scripture, answer a question with a question. You answer a question with a question. Do you believe that God has called the church to do little things? I believe He's called us to do little, medium, big Way too big, ridiculously big, and can't understand how it happened. I believe we meet all of those needs. I believe we're supposed to walk with somebody when they have a cold, and we're supposed to hand the whole, hold the hand of somebody who's, who's, who's lost it all. We're supposed to walk with the person who just can't pay their electric bill, and we're supposed to help figure out how to dig the person out who's getting ready to declare bankruptcy. I believe that we're supposed to, 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 to talk to the person who might be addicted to cigarettes or who might be addicted to alcohol, and we're also supposed to hold the hand of somebody that just overdosed on heroin and, and walk with their family. I I don't believe we stop just because the problems are big and small. And I don't believe we stop just because the vision's big or small. He's called us to big things and little things and medium-sized things and ridiculous-sized things and I don't know how they happen sort of things. There's a list of reasons why vision attracts critics. Now they're called trolls, keyboard warriors, you can't even post something on Facebook that God's doing in your life without somebody telling you how ridiculously crazy you are. Post it anyway. We need more positive posts. Ultimately, it boils down to one underlying truth. There, there, there's, a reason, there's a reason that God-given vision and God-given dreams face criticism, and it's this. It's that, it's that people need change, but often they don't like the discomfort or disruption of seeing it happen. They want to be able to get to the end product without the process that gets you there. And I'm going to tell you right now, the devil doesn't like change in your life either. At all. When you were in sin, he really likes the power of keeping you there. He doesn't want the change that comes at Calvary. He doesn't want the change that comes with the blood. And he certainly doesn't want a new believer getting a picture of where they can go and who they can be and how much authority they have. He certainly doesn't want that one believer turning into two believers or three believers or four believers or five believers. He certainly doesn't want that mom and dad to start raising Christian youngins. He wants to break that marriage up. He does not like change. And oftentimes that's where the criticism comes from is it's going to create change. I, I would submit to you, most of us in here struggle with change. I, I, I'll give you an example. I love, I, I, I love a fresh paved, especially in Ohio at this time of the year, I love a fresh paved Ohio road. Can I, can I get an amen? amen. Like where the, I like it where the black top is still black. It's not even faded yet, you know. I love as I, every year that goes by, I, I, because my eyesight's not what it should be. I really am supposed to wear glasses, but I don't. So when I knocked the piano over last week, that was, that was actually an impairment problem. But I, 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 love, I, love being able, I love being able to see edge lines in the center line. I love that fresh paint on the side of the roads. I love a new road. I hate orange barrel and cone season though i like the end product i hate the process if you've ever lived in ohio that's what we, we go from pothole season to orange barrel and cone season i don't know about you but there's certain places in this town i can't get get to without using 30 i've just chosen not to see family for some of you it was because of it was because of the virus it was because of 30 for me i ain't driving that road forget about it i'm done with you 
You live over there. I'm done with you people. I hate driving 30 right now. I don't understand what's happening there. There's one, there's one change that I don't like in, in roads and driving. I don't care how fresh it is and how nice the, 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 the asphalt is. I can't stand roundabouts. I hate them. Just put a stoplight in. Can I get an amen? amen? What is that? It's like hopscotch or double dutch. You don't know when to jump in. You know, just waiting. Just... You know you're going to get hit. It's going to be low speed, though. Listen, that's a, that's, a, that's a silly way of presenting the case that change. Change is the hard part. Most of us in here, when we hear, some, when we hear a vision from somebody, man, when like a 12-year-old tells you, like, one day I'm going to grow up and I'm going to start a homeless shelter, like we know in our heart that's a great thing. But some of us are naturally wired to start casting doubt in the life of that child. And they have to work through whether or not it's coming from the Lord instead of saying, you know what, bud, let's pray about that. If this is what God has for us, I want to be on board. You know what, I, 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 I hear vision of, of young people, you know, wouldn't it be great? And I, wouldn't it be great to have this and to do that? You know, I shared a vision last week where, where, where a lady had started an all children's only church in Atlanta, Georgia. And no church would partner with her because you have to have adults at the church. You can't just start, uh, you can't just start a, a church for kids. She got more doubt than she, she had more referees than she did cheerleaders. 3,000 kids engage in that church a weekend. It's got a school. The school costs $20 a month for kids, for disenfranchised kids in Atlanta to go to. Why? Because the doubters weren't able to stop her. I can't stand up here and tell you, I cannot stand up here and tell you that criticism is not going to come your way. I cannot stand up here and tell you that doubt is not going to come your way. What I'm here to do is to equip you how to deal with doubt, how to deal with criticism, how to know whether or not it's from the Lord. And if it's from the Lord, sink your claws into it. Don't let it go. Pursue it. Chase after it. Don't care what it costs you. Run hard after the plan of God for your life. Let me read to you what it looks like in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. I think it'll be up here on the screen. This is a portion of the story where Nehemiah has started to build. He's cast his vision. He's examined the work, and he knows what, he knows what it's going to take, and he's begun the work, and it, it says this in verse 1. Now it came about that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. And the Bible says he was very angry and he mocked the Jews. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Here comes somebody else. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him and said, even what they're building, if a fox should jump on it, would break down their stone wall. Two people who literally are exceptionally, exceptionally thorough. I mean thorough in their criticism. Because if you read back through Nehemiah chapter 4, Sambalat starts off by criticizing the character of the building. There's going to be times where the criticism isn't about your plan. There's going to be times where the criticism isn't about the providence or the provision for your plan. You need to hear this. There's going to be times where the criticism is about you directly. Remember Jesus? Isn't that just the son of the carpenter boy? Isn't he just a, isn't he just a carpenter's son and now we're supposed to, we're supposed to follow this guy? That's just Joseph's son. There's going to be times where people remember who you were so much that it's hard for them to see who you're becoming. Can I just share with you sometimes that person that criticizes you is actually you. Sometimes it's you that has trouble laying a hold of who God says you are. 
of what God says you're able to do, of the promises that he says are available to you. Sometimes it's hard for you to, it's, it's hard for you to lay a hold of the, the new you because the old you might have been recent or the, new you might, the old you might have been so prevalent or the old you might have, might, have, might have done things so bad that you're ashamed so much of what you've done that it's hard for you to walk in this new freedom that pastors stand up and tell you you should have. And Yeah, pastor, I came to an altar and I prayed and I felt good. And Yeah, pastor, I quit doing that and I don't do that anymore. But people know me. I'm from this area and people are going to question me if I try to do something because I was that heroin addict. Or I was that, that girl, that's that, that girl, that guy that slept around. I, I was that person that was that alcoholic. I, I was that person that got married three times and, and now I'm trying to save marriages and I've got three divorces behind me and nobody's going to take me serious. Listen to me. It's you that needs to take you serious. God is not going to use you because you're perfect. He's going to use you in spite of the fact that you're not. And God is not going to use you because you're perfect. He's going to use your past to help somebody else's future. Listen to me. Some people who are lost in the dark need somebody else who is lost in the dark and say, hey, I know the way out. There's a light right over here. Follow me. Come on, I'm grabbing your arm and I'm going to walk you right out of this. I know the way out of this because I was just as deep. I might have been a little further in the dark than you, but I know the way out. I know the person that can get you out. I'm going to take you there. Follow me. Man, God's not going to use you because you're perfect. God's not going to use you because you have a perfect past. There's only been one person that was perfect and we hung him on a cross. There's, no, there's been nobody since that's perfect. I get so tired of watching women and men post about my spouse is just the most perfect thing in the world. Get that off of Facebook. I know your husband. He ain't perfect. Mm-mm. He ain't. He got two, three issues. Okay? Maybe four. Your wife, she ain't perfect. She's a nice lady, but she ain't perfect. She got four or five issues. Listen, one of them is you. <laughs> Listen, you might, you might be a good person. There's nothing wrong with being a good person, but you're not a perfect person. You gotta let that go. There's times where we struggle with moving out of the plan God has for our life because we feel like we're not worthy of the plan that God has for our life. And you are biting down on the lie from the enemy. You're clamping on to it. You are a child of the most high God. Amen. You are joint heirs with Jesus. You are kingdom creatures, man. You're brand new. I said it earlier that God doesn't refurbish. Listen, I've used this metaphor so many times in ministry, but I love it like this. But 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 most of you don't. Most of you ain't gonna know what I'm talking about. Anybody remember chalkboards back in the day? Okay, kids, chalkboards were things kids they wrote on with chalk. You don't know what chalk is? I'll explain that to you later. Okay, because they don't even have chalkboards no more. But there was I, I love watching teachers clean chalkboards because invariably, man, they would erase those words off of that chalkboard. But you would always see that dust there, right? You'd always see that dust and and then it was always satisfying to me because i'm a weird obsessive compulsive cleaner because i was raised that way I, I would always love when the teacher finally got to the point where the the, the the board got so dirty she'd get out like the windex and she'd actually clean the board but there still was a haze there there still was a remnant there of even though it was cleaned up there was still a remnant there and i think most of us see our relationship with god that way that you know what there's an erasing of what's happened, but the dust is still there and the remnant is still there. Listen, God doesn't erase your past. God rips the chalkboard off the wall and brings in a brand new chalkboard. He says, now that's you. That's you. That's how it works. That's how regeneration works. He didn't say you're a refurbished creature in Christ. You are a new creation. You're brand new. The old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. You can be your biggest critic. You can be the biggest reason that you know you don't move out of your destiny. You don't move out into the plan that God has for you. And it's not that you're doing anything bad. You left the bad, but you haven't pressed on to the great. Some of us in here won't press to the great because we're stuck in the good. Good is always the enemy of the best. It's always the enemy of the best. I got a good job. Is it the best job? I'm doing what the Lord's called me to do as good as I can do it. Are you doing it the best you can do it? Are you moving in your best? Sam Ballot criticized the character of the builders. Then he questioned their ability. People are going to question your ability. Listen, that's going to happen all the time. People can question my ability to pastor. All I would tell them is I'm not the best pastor, but I'm growing. I'm going to continue to grow. When I'm out of ministry, I'll stop growing. But at some point in time, at some point in time, I'm going to be as good as I'm ever going to get. I don't believe I've hit my ceiling yet. I'm growing. I'm growing. I make mistakes. 
I'm growing. I'm growing. Go ahead and question my ability. I'm growing. Question my ability to sing. Good, I retired today. <laughs> but I'm growing. Well, pastor, you're middle aged I'm still growing. Grow daily or die gradually. He challenged their commitment to finish. Some people will challenge that in your life, won't they? Man, everything he starts, he never finishes. Prove him wrong one time. I've started some things that I haven't finished because there's some things I've started in the flesh and realized they were stupid and I stopped. There, there are times I've started things that I've, I didn't finish them because I realized they weren't worthy of my time. Or something else took a higher priority. But when it comes to the vision of God, you're going to have people say, they're not going to see it through. I've watched them do this a hundred times. Prove them wrong. Prove them wrong because what's on the other side of that calling and that vision and that purpose for your life is a person, a soul, somebody that needs that, that vision that God's deposited in your heart to come to pass. There's that part. Listen, all vision, all God-given destiny, all God-given uh, 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 a purpose has a person in mind for you following through. They're your assignment. They're your reason. They're the tribe that you're supposed to reach. He questioned the feasibility of the project to begin with. And then his, his sidekick describes his work as incompetent. Well, that stone wall, if a fox were to jump on top of it, I don't know why I gave him a country accent because this is the Middle East, but they were, they were from the Middle East and the South. Uh, but... but if a fox were to jump on that wall, that wall would come tumbling down. There's going to be people that say, yeah, that, what you're doing is not that great. I know somebody that does it better than you. I can tell you this. I've had people through the years compare us to other churches. Well, this church is doing this and that church is doing that. Good for them. I'm rooting them on. That's their assignment. But I'm going to go over here and be who God called me to be. It took me years to even figure out what kind of preacher I was to find my voice in ministry. When you first get into ministry, you try to emulate the people that you like to listen to. And I was eclectic, so like if you came, if you came early on to my youth ministry, man, one week I was T.D. Jakes, the next week I was Jeannie Mayo, the week after that I was Joel Osteen. You know, I was all these different people. I, I, I was trying to emulate. And, and, and there's times where we try to put on somebody else's armor and fight a battle with armor that doesn't fit us. Listen, sometimes, sometimes people are going to describe your work as incompetent, but you need to understand competence comes from God. God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. Let me say that again for you in the back. God does not call the equipped. He equips the the called. He always has. He always will. If he brings you up to it, he's going to give you the ability to get through it. I'm telling you this. I'm trying to give you as many idioms as I can possibly give you so you remember. Understand, if God's calling you, he will make it come to pass. Don't give up. When somebody calls into question the competency of your work, what are you doing? I'm that type of way sometimes in buildings. People be like, well, you know what? I see a spot up there. Let me go get you a paintbrush. <laughs> Toilet leaks. So it flushes. You got a wrench? Yeah, I got a wrench. Go in there and fix it. Okay. We, 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 we get so worried about people who's... who's it's like their purpose in life is to be a problem pointer. I, I, I think there's people that think that's their calling. My, my, pro, my, my purpose in life is to point out problems. Listen, if you think your purpose in life is to point out problems, you found that your purpose is to be the problem. Don't bring me a problem if you don't want to be a part of the solution. There's going to be critics along the way. That's all right. Win them over. Win them over. Listen, this place would be a whole lot better with you in it. Why don't you come along? You got good ideas. I, you know what? What I hear you saying is that you think this needs to be done. What I hear you saying is you think this is a good thing. Let's go ahead and get you involved, plugged in and invested in this place. And you're going to make a difference. I just see it in you, brother. I see it in you, sister. I, 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 I've won a few people that way when I didn't get mad. I've won a few people that way. It goes on in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. I got, I got to let you all go. No, I don't. There's no service after this one. <laughs> Buckle up, okay? 
Now, now when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the, there's a lot of ites in here, Ashdodites, heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. You need to understand, Sam Ballot was a man of authority and he was reaping the benefit of Jerusalem not being who God had called it to be. And so he knew he had something to lose and he knew that if he could, if he could stop them, that he would continue. Remember, he didn't want change. He knew if he could stop them, his way of life, his comfort level would stay up. And it says this, all of them conspired to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. Listen, when the devil starts sending people to tear down what you're building, you're on to something, child of God. I'm telling you, when the enemy starts sending people to literally begin tearing down what you're doing, you know that you're in the middle of something. I got a call in the middle of the night when we were when we were Pavilion Community Church out on Mill Street. The building was starting to fill up and, and God was moving. I got a call in the middle of the night from my brother-in-law hey uh you need to wake up okay well the phone call did that what's going on our church is on fire okay he's like didn't you hear me our church is on fire I was like dude i'm sleeping we got insurance it'll be fine it was an arsonist that lit our building on fire i'm like woo! devil's taking notice we must be doing something all right just burnt the siding up no big deal nobody even saw it you know Nobody even saw it. I don't, those sorts of things don't bother me because I know when I'm opposed by somebody that I can clearly tell isn't walking with the Lord, I know that we're in the middle of something that God wants us to be in the middle of. So oftentimes when I see the hand of the end of the enemy move, it is a signal flare that the hand of God is moving at the same time. Where sin abounds, grace does that much more. I know God is moving when the devil is, and there's times where that's the greatest indicator of the impact that you're having. How much of a disruption are you causing? Well, pastor's calling us, call, call, telling us to cause a disturbance. I didn't say that. I'm not telling you to cause a physical disturbance. I'm telling you to cause a spiritual one. Ruffle some feathers of the enemy. Ruffle some feathers of some demons. Ruffle some feathers of, uh, of the enemy of our soul. We should be... L listen, when you walk into the room, the devil should know he's got to go out. When you walk into the room, the devil should know he has a problem. And you need to understand when you have problems and he presents you with problems, it's because you show promise and he has a problem with that. Why am I getting fought so hard, pastor? I get asked that question all the time. Why am I getting fought so hard? Because your potential is so big. That's why you're getting fought so hard. Because the headspace in your life is so high, you might not see it right now, but you're getting fought because of your future. That's why you're getting fought. And sometimes, man, sometimes we will we'll give up when we start facing opposition. There's even, a, there's even a saying that we'll say, well, no good deed goes unpunished. We, we have some of the worst, no good deed goes unpunished. I, I, I should have known this was coming. It was just, I did a good thing and people just pfft, all over me. Listen, I've lived there before. If you've ever tried to step out with God, be ready for your character to be impugned. Be ready for somebody to say you're not worthy. Be ready for somebody to tell you you don't know how. Be ready for somebody to tell you you don't have enough finances. You don't have enough help. You don't have enough people. You don't have enough experience. Be ready for it. I've always loved that one. You don't have enough experience. Well, I'm trying to get some. Shut up. <laughs> Listen, but it doesn't stop there. It starts off as criticism. It starts off as critiques. It starts off as, as backbiting and infighting and fighting. And it starts off with words. And then in Nehemiah chapter 4, 7 through 8, it starts off as a plan. Nehemiah, Nehemiah 4 it goes on here. Oh, our God. How we are despised, return the reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. This is the word of Nehemiah. You ever prayed that prayer for somebody before? David prays these prayers sometimes. Don't forgive them. Don't blot out their name. And the blah, blah, blah. He says, do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before you for they have demoralized the builders. Nehemiah started praying to God, listen, they've come against my people, my plan, my purpose. I'm just asking right now that you don't forgive them for anything they ever do. I've not prayed those prayers. I'm guessing grace wasn't high on Nehemiah's list. 
But he did the right thing. He prayed. When we face criticism, do we pray about it? Or do we scroll through the comments section on Facebook to see how bad it's gotten? When we face criticism, do, do we pray about it or do we feel like we've got to answer every criticism and the thread turns into a pastor's been watching my Facebook. No, I, I, I see it sometimes where it just turns into this long thread of jockeying back and forth about who's writer. That wasn't right. And we feel like we've got to establish our position. We've got to answer every criticism. You don't have to answer every criticism. Sometimes you have to pray about it. I'm almost done. Had a boy, Ed. Gave him the wink and the gun. He remembered where his vision came from. There's times in the middle of a project, and, and there's times, I can tell you this, I can get vision and project fatigue. <sighs> I'm going to Florida in a couple months. See you guys. Um, <laughs> not even a couple months, a couple weeks. Woo! All right. Just me and my wife. I'm turning 40 in Florida. Going to Florida. Okay. I can get vision in project fatigue, but you have to remember who told you to do it. Why you're here. What your purpose is. You have to remember what won't happen if you don't. Let me say that again. When God calls you to something, you have to remember what won't happen if you don't. Who won't hear? Who won't be saved? Who won't be set free? Whose life won't be changed? There's times where we can get so tired, so much so that Scripture admonishes us to not grow weary in doing well. But we can face, we can face opposition to the place where what once was a joy can become a burden. And it's not the job of the critic to become unburdensome. It's the job of the visionary to become unfazed. It's your ability to walk through fire and come out just smelling like smoke. God never promised you that everything he called you to would be easy. In fact, a lot of what he calls you to, it, it's the opposite of easy. Anyone who desires to follow after me should take up his cross and follow after me. It's easy to wear those little gold crosses around our neck, isn't it? It's easy to put an ichthus on the back of our car. It's easy to wear the Christian t-shirt. The cross is the electric chair. It's the gas chamber. It's... It's the firing squad. It, 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 it's a means and mode of death. The heaviest one to bear. And what Jesus was saying is you are symbolically showing people that you have died to yourself. And dying to yourself, dying to your own plans, dying to what you thought was going to happen with your life and being willing to surrender. See, that's hard. That's tough. It's tough to get up and move your family. It's tough to take the risk and sacrifice. It's tough to put your finances and stretch your finances through. It's tough to move to a different country because God's called you to be a missionary. It's tough, but it is worth it. And who won't if you don't? And there are times we have to remember that. We have to ask that question. Nehemiah 4.9, we prayed to our God and because of them we set up a guard against them day and night. Nehemiah prayed, Nehemiah remembered where his vision came from, but Nehemiah made adjustments to his plan. I could tell you in, I call it the coronavirus era. I don't, I don't know what else to call it. 
the church has had to adjust its plans a thousand and one times. And it's been tough. I was just talking with a pastor, Pastor Matt Pond, who also works at uh, Wapner Funeral Home. I said, how's your church doing, man? He's like, it's been tough. I said, I know. I said, people are mad at you to, no matter what decision you make. You close, people are mad at you. You open, people are mad at you. You have one service, mad. Mass, mad. No mass, mad. Pro-vaccine, mad. Anti-vaccine, mad. Like being a pastor in this season has been We'll just call it different. It's been different. (laughs) We've made adjustments. Nehemiah's adjustment was this. My vision is so worth it that we're going to do the work and then we're going to guard the work. Later on in the Bible, the Bible says he has a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. He's literally working and fighting at the same time. Is what God called you to do worth guarding and is it worth fighting for? Somebody saw you as worth fighting for. Can you work while you fight? Let's stand to our feet. Your God given destiny. Your God-given vision, it's worth building. It's worth protecting. It's worth fighting for. It's worth not giving up on. You can get through this life and you can have a good life, man. You can get through this life and you can have some, some money in the bank and you can retire and go be somewhere warm in, in, in the winter months or every month. You can spend your days out on the golf course, golfing. There's nothing wrong with doing any of those things. We all need periods of rest, Sabbath, sabbatical. We need time away. I don't want to enter my rest rested. You hear what I'm saying? We always tell people, rest in peace. I don't want to move into my rest rested. I want to move into my rest after I have been wrung out, spin up, have no rubber left on the wheels. The, the offering has been poured out and the cup is empty and I need, the only logical option is to go to eternity because God has used me to the nth degree on this side and there's nothing left to pour out over here. It's a season of Him getting ready to pour in because the pour out has happened. Don't enter your rest rested. It's never too late. It's never the wrong time to start moving out into who God called you to be. It's never too late to to move out into purpose and destiny. It's never too late to pray, God, I've not prayed this way before. I've not asked for a vision before. And God will answer you by saying, I've just been waiting. Oh, I've been waiting. I'm about to show you some things. Some of you don't know what your dreams are because you haven't ever dreamed It's time to dream. It's time to believe big. Some of you are, are, are in that spot where you're moving out into that scary place that seems a little, a little shaky, but you know, you know that next step's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Can I just tell you, it's safer to go than it is to stay. It's safer to move than it is to be still. The safest place is wherever Christ is at. And if he's out in your vision... The safest place to be is wherever he is at. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for you all, but if if at the end of this, man, you need prayer for anything, I'm going to have Reverend L come. I, I, I'm going to have some people come to the front. I'm going to pray for all of us today, but if you want to pray, man, God is stirring in your heart. God is stirring. Maybe maybe, maybe you're in the spot where you're facing criticism. Maybe, maybe you. Maybe you're having trouble letting go. God wants to break that off of you today. Because he can't keep you where you're at and move you where you're going. And so when I say amen to this, we're going to turn the music up. 
If you need to go, I ask that you go as quietly as possible. But if you need to come, man, we want to pray for you. And we'll just kind of fade out. Is that fair? Let me pray for you today. Father, right now, Lord, it seems so cliche to say that you've you've called us to be world changers. The reality is that is the truth. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. Baptize people. We're supposed to be taking ground for the kingdom. We're called to be the head and not the tail. We're called to be pace setters and trend setters and people who are propagating the gospel of peace. That happens, Lord, when we move out into the, the vision that you've called us to. And Lord, God-given vision isn't always pulpit vision. It could be feeding the homeless. It could be ministering to the sick. It could be dealing with people who are addicted. It could be helping marriages that are broken. All leading them to Jesus. The church is an embassy. The church is a place of safety for people to run into, to get charged up, to get the materials that they need to go out and make an impact in their world. This is just a a place of safety for us to get ready to go out and be who you've called us to be. And as we reach, yeah, the church grows as a natural byproduct, but the church universal is growing when we do what we're called to do. God, I pray that you would burden us not only with concerns for our culture, but I pray this, Lord, that we would continually ask us ourselves this question. If I won't do what God has called me to do, who won't get to hear the gospel? And I pray, Lord, that that at times would keep us up at night. I pray, Lord, that that would keep us prayed up, fasted, ready for what it is that you've called us to. Help us to remember who you've called us to be, what you've called us to do, the plan, the purpose that you have for our life. I pray vision over every single person here. Lord, I, 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 young, old, male, female, red, yellow, black, and white. I don't care, Lord. You have a plan and a purpose, a big, big plan and purpose for every single person here. The body of Christ is diverse. You need every single person here moving out into who we're called to be. We're more, the body of Christ is more diverse than anything else in our country, Lord. We need to be impactful. We need to be impactful where we're at. So God, I pray that you would move us out into that purpose and that destiny. And here's what I pray as we get ready to go. That Richland County will never be the same. It'll never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. If you need prayer for anything, Reverend L, would you come? Maybe a couple elders. Let's pray.